This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. Hey everybody, welcome into a post-Thanksgiving Day solo edition of the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cattles. Gave Nick uh, the the day off to spend time with the lovely Kelly. I'm sure they're having fun, but of course, I'm here for you. And I'm here because this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code CLNS to get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code CLNS on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks, run your game. And take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. Uh, so the uh, the format of this podcast, um, I was going to go heavy on the mailbag, but uh, sort of depends on how long I spe- uh, spend on the Colts. I actually think this is a pretty interesting matchup between these two teams. Uh, I think everybody's looked at the Patriots schedule. This is uh, most likely the last winnable game that they have. Um, so it would be nice for them to get a victory. Um, so we'll we'll dive into some mailbag questions, um, but we will start with the headlines like we normally do. The Patriots were off entirely on Thanksgiving Day, which is, I look back to last year, they did the same thing. Now they were coming back back from a bye week most years with the Patriots when Belichick was here. It was sort of early in, early out on Thanksgiving Day. So interesting that Gerard moved everything up a day and took Thursday off. So they're back at it today on on Friday. Uh, He spoke to the media today. Probably the most interesting things um, that he talked about, and of course I forgot to get the quote, but I will get it in a second. Um, so first off, let's talk. I don't think we talked last podcast about the Michael Jordan release. So they claimed Lester Cotton off of waivers from the Dolphins. Uh, I've seen Cotton a little bit over the years. Um, he hasn't been overly impressive, but I told you before the season started that they were going to churn the bottom of the roster. Now, does Michael Jordan being the starting left guard basically for 11 of 12 games is at the bottom of the roster? I think it's more of a case of the Patriots are getting down to it now with five games left and it's, and it's basically, all right, well, is this guy going to be part of us going forward or not? And if the answer is no, let's try to start to take a look at some other things, um, including a guy like Cotton, but also a guy like City So or Layden Robinson, who's been um, training up a little bit more at left guard to possibly put them in in, and get an evaluation of where they are. And that relates to the quote that Mayo said today, which was. um, So he would say, you need a guy like Layden Robinson to show what he can do. We need a guy like Cole Strange before the end of the season to see what he can do. You can use Caden in the same bucket. We need to see what the receivers can do and what they're going to look like going forward. And that's the hard part for me. Look, you want to win right now. But at the same time, I think it would be a disservice to go to the end of the season and not know exactly what we have. Um, Okay. I mean, I understand that. And I think that the Mayo is telling the truth. You know, I also think it's a little bit of a convenient excuse. Um, should they get trounced in the final four weeks of the season? It's a ready-made excuse to say, hey, look, we were trying a bunch of guys out. But they do need to do those sorts of things. Um, it is a tough balance. So I respect what he said about that. Um, but, you know, I do think, you know, a guy like Layden Robinson – I do think he's proven that he's going to be a player in this league. Now, it wasn't great the last time he was out there. I thought they put him in a bad position against Jeffrey Simmons. Um, Caden Wallace, that's a guy, especially with the situation at right tackle with Demontre Jacobs. Uh, you know, could they take a look at him? Um, you know, 
Absolutely. And the receivers. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, you know, you still got to be careful about have these guys earned their playing time or not, because then things start to get dicey, um, you know, in the locker room. Gerard Mayo said today that uh, Cole Strange will not be up this week. He was asked about Jabril Peppers. They kind of ne- needed to see how it how it would look. Uh, I practice on Friday. I'm not sure I really buy that. I think Peppers is going to be back in the lineup. I think this is a team against Anthony Richardson and against um, uh, the running back, Jonathan Taylor, who um, this is a game where they're going to need Peppers and his physicality, and they could use his intensity as well with what's been going and also the miscommunication on the back end. So uh, I do think that we're going to see Jabril Peppers, and I just think they're trying to be coy about it and not answer too many questions, not get in the weeds about Pepper's situation since it hasn't really been clarified. He's still, the trial date is still set. Um, it gets a little bit dicey. I mean, they, I assume they have information that this thing might go away somewhat soon because um, it's kind of a bad look if you're putting a player out there that is currently facing a jury trial for domestic violence. So, um, Tough road to navigate. As far as the offensive line, what we're going to see with them on Sunday, I I really have no idea what we're going to see. Uh, I assume Vidarian Lowe is going to be back at left tackle. Mayo acknowledged that Michael Jordan, he just signed back to the practice squad. He has one more elevation left. Um, and we've seen this sort of scenario before where they release a guy, he's on the practice squad, but they can elevate him and he can still start, but he's not, quote unquote, um, you know, on the roster. Um, you know, could they cook, uh, could they, could we see a winning out of right tackle and Lane Robinson in at right guard or uh, yeah, right guard Robinson could be in a left guard city. So could be there. It sounded like city. So is going to start at right tackle, but, um, we'll have to see about that. Basically, uh, there's a lot of things up in the air. Um, we will get into the Colts. Uh, in just a couple minutes, as soon as I tell you about Prize Picks, Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over five million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to a hundred times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. Prize Picks is the best way to win real money this football season. Which players are going off? Which ones aren't? Make your pick in less than 60 seconds and turn your sports opinions into real money all season long on Prize Picks. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code CLNS and get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code CLNS on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks, run your game. Okay, taking a look at this week's opponent, Indianapolis Colts. They are five and seven. They have lost um, three of four. They started out zero and two, then won four to the next five, and they have now lost four out of five. But some context has to come with that. Those losses came against the Houston Texans, the Minnesota Vikings, the Buffalo Bills, and the Detroit Lions, all playoff teams. So um, if you look at uh, DVOA, they're very similar to the Rams. Actually, they're one spot below the Rams. The Rams are 20th. The Colts are 21st. They have the 21st offense. They have the 16th defense. They are ninth on special teams. And I wanted to take a look at their schedule. Future schedule is easy. They have played the fifth hardest schedule Um To this point, looking at the two teams uh, over the last four games, and this is even more difficult with the Colts because Anthony Richardson uh, has only started the last two games. The previous two games were Joe Flacco before they benched Flacco and put Richardson back in. He came back, led them to a victory over the Jets. He played really well. I think he threw for like 270 yards in that game. Um, These two teams over the last four games are pretty similar. Both are one and four. They both don't score a lot. Uh, The Colts have averaged about 17 points a game during that. Uh, The Patriots have uh, have 
averaged about 18 points. Um, opponents have averaged about 26 points a game over the last four compared to 21 for the Patriots, of course. Um, you know, the the uh, the Colts have played a very tough schedule. I mean, you know, with what they've had to gone against, have gone against, uh, I think the Bears game is kind of, skewing a lot of the Patriots numbers. We know how they've been the last two weeks. Not very good. Um, as we all know, the Bears, not only did they fire their offensive coordinator after playing the Patriots, they just fired their head coach. Uh, so very similar to um, the Jets in terms of, you know, what's been going on with uh, former Patriots opponents. Um, you're looking at yards over the last four the Colts are 28th in the league. The Patriots are 21st. Yards allowed. Colts are 24th. The Patriots are 13th. Um, turnovers, very similar to the Patriots. Uh, the Colts, and of course, Flacco was responsible for a lot of these. Um, they turn it over about 1.7, 1. 1.75 times a game. Patriots are at two. Uh, big difference. The Colts get turnovers. They are uh, they're getting one one point two five per game. The Patriots are only getting point five. And of course, um, <clears throat> well, that might have to do with the Dolphins basically giving you a fumble when they couldn't get the exchange. Um, very similar. Both these teams could be very sloppy. Um, a lot of dumb penalties. Uh, the Colts are at six point seven five. Penalties per game over the last four. The Patriots are are at eight. Um, they are both in the bottom, near the bottom of the league. With that, um, as far as efficiency, um, with EPA uh, over the last four, the Col uh, Colts are thirtieth. Patriots are twenty fourth. Defensive, uh, the Colts are thirteenth. Patriots are ninth. Special teams, Colts are 16th, Patriots are 12th. Um, pass, offensive pass EPA, Colts are 29th, Patriots are 25th. Rush, Colts are 28th, Patriots are 20th. T defensive pass EPA, this is where uh, it gets interesting. The Colts are 5th over the last four games, even against what they've gone against, probably because who they've gone against. Patriots are 16th. Rushing EPA, Colts are, this is on defense, 28th. Patriots are fifth. Um, you know, both teams are one and three in their last four. Like I said, that for the for the Colts, that's against the Vikings, the Bills, the Jets, and the Lions. For the Patriots, Titans, Bears, Rams, Dolphins. You're talking about probably one team that's in the playoffs, Rams, and that's iffy. Um, the Dolphins don't look. Uh, like they're headed there because of uh, what we just saw uh, on Thanksgiving. Um, let's see. What did I want to talk about? So let's start with uh, the Colts offense versus the Patriots defense. I know you're going to hear a lot of things about Anthony Richardson, about his, I think he's completing 47% of his passes. He completed 39% last week against the Lions. And I did want to point out that Lions game, that was uh, only a 27, 24 to 6 loss to the Lions. And we know how good the Lions are. Dan Campbell talked after the game how much of a pain in the butt that they were to play against, how hard they played. Um, they basically they, would, they hung around the entire game um, and made it really tough on the Lions. Um, Anthony Richardson, you might not you know, be blown away by – you know, his stats against the Lions. But I watched the film, and I also watched J.T. O'Sullivan's breakdown of the Colts. Um, the Colts couldn't really run the ball. Um, I think they're having a tough time marrying uh, Richardson's run game with what Taylor does well. Um, I think they're having difficulties with that. But I got to tell you, this, um, this Colts offense is going to present difficulties in this game um the stats do not tell the whole tale now you know the Colts this is what they did against the Lions I mean they played like the Patriots did against the Dolphins I mean with all the penalties I think they had 10 penalties a lot of them were stupid 
A lot of them were pre-snap. Um, it ruined some really good plays. They had some really bad drops in the game, including one potential touchdown, which I think would have put the the Colts up 10 nothing in that game, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it just was the opening drive and it was the opening field goal. Um, but what they do, and just to give you a little background, Shane Steichen is the Colts head coach. He came from the Eagles. He was the Eagles offensive coordinator um, that year with Jalen Hurts, how he suddenly popped uh, their run and pass game. Um, he does a lot of really good stuff. He's, he's going to stress this Patriots defense big time. I do think the Patriots have a built-in advantage uh, if they win this game, especially if they play well defensively. It's going to be because of Joe Milton because he's on the roster and he is basically um, very close to Anthony Richardson in terms of size, speed, arm strength, all that stuff. So that's a great asset to have in this game. Um, that could really add them. Uh, I think that the, the Colts have a bunch of speed you know, on the outside. They will not have Josh Downs this week as I said, which is a, a shame because he's a good player. He's a speedy little player. Uh, but they still have Mitchell, who was I, I was impressed with. Um, so they still have uh, Alec Pierce, who's really good, sort of the number one. Michael Pittman is out there. You got um, Mitchell. Um, you know, I will say the Colts offensive line is not that great. Quentin Nelson, I don't know if he's hurt or what, but what I saw in film last week, he is not Quentin Nelson like best offensive lineman in the league that you remember from before. The rest of the line's pretty ordinary. Bernard Raymond, Raymond, he should be good to go this week. He was a 2022 third round pick. He was one of those guys that the, that Bill Belichick could have drafted to get him in the pipeline. He needed development, but he was one of those guys that I talked about that they they could have gone and drafted to sort of start. The process, um, of course, Jonathan Taylor's in the backfield. Trey Sermon is a speedy little uh, back as well. Tyler Goodson is the backup. Um, tight end, they have Mo Alley-Cox. Um, they don't really have a ton at tight end. That was where they had one of the big drops last week. Um so that's sort of a look at the Colts offense. I mean, I just think, you know, I know I know Richardson's stats were bad last week, but um, he was a lot better on film. He made some uh, ridiculous plays in that game. Their quarterback run game, they do it all. It is going to be a pain in the butt. Um, I did want to point out that as far as um, big plays, in the game, you know, you had the Lions versus the Colts. You know, you figure the Lions are going to go uh, do their thing all over the place with Ben Johnson and Jared Goff and all those guys. <clears throat> the Colts only had two uh, passing plays over 20 yards in that game. They both happened in the first quarter and a half of the game. Uh, one was a sort of dump down to Tim Patrick. Uh, he went for 27. The other one went to Jameson Williams for 21. That was it as far as big plays in the pass game. Listen to the, what the Colts had. Anthony Richardson passed deep left to Alec Pierce, 39 yards. Richardson passed deep left. Michael Pittman, 22 yards. Richardson passed short right to Pittman, 30 yards. Richardson passed short middle to Pittman, 24 yards. So the Colts doubled up uh, as far as passing big plays. I mean, this is a this is a big play offense. They, they're going to get big plays. Richardson had a couple of uh, quarterback designed runs that almost broke to the house if they would have uh, if they would have run it or blocked it just a little bit differently. And then you have the ability for him to go down the field. Steichen also does a good job scheming them some things up. I think in some of these games where the score's gotten out of whack, Richardson, a lot of his stats go downhill after that. And like I said, I don't think the offensive line is that great. So uh, pressure is an issue, but make no mistake. <clears throat> This Colts offense is going to be a load for this Patriots to handle, and I really don't love the matchup. Again, if the Patriots do well on defense against the Colts, it's going to be because of Joe Milton. 
because he gave them a really good look in practice all week. Kind of look that a lot of teams can't get with a with a quarterback like uh, Richardson. Uh, let me tell you about game time. Game time picks filter out all the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Love the all-in pricing. Toggling this feature shows you the total up front with no surprise fees at checkouts. Seat views. Get a panoramic view for your receipt in the app before you buy. It's it's football season. It's college basketball season. You got to be there in person. I was just looking. I'm trying to get down to my alma mater, Rutgers, the rack. There's nothing like being at a game at the rack, a Big Ten game. It's loud. All the sights, sounds. Got to root my team on. We only have the best freshman, maybe the best player in the country in Dylan Harper, who is the truth. Ace Bailey, not that bad uh, either. Both will be lottery picks this coming. I got to get down there. I got to see my guys, and I'm going to do that through game time. I also was looking, and if you wanted to get to watch the Bruins, so we all know Bruins tickets are kind of expenses. I was just looking. Red Wings at Bruins, December 3rd, Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. We know the Red Wings are kind of buns, but you can get in the building to watch the Bruins. I saw one of the amazing deals, the game time picks, uh, 78 bucks all in for row 11 in the balcony. You know, you've been there before. You can see everything. So make sure you get over to game time. Use the promo code, and I'll give you that in a second. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Uh, okay, so the Patriots offense versus the Colts defense. Um, this is going to be another difficult matchup. I was uh, pleasantly surprised by the Colts on film against the Lions. I thought they did a really good job. Their defensive line gets after it. They they go wide splits. They try to split gaps. Um, they have fast linebackers. They have fast players all over the place. They do a really good job covering in the secondary. Now, I hate Gus Bradley's scheme. Um, I did see him match a little bit more in this game than he has in the past. But it's clear to me, watching these guys, guys on film, they play fast. It's a simple scheme which allows your players to play fast, and they do. They're pretty assignment sure. Um, the linebackers fly around. They flow. They do a good job in the run game. The Lions really didn't get off on that. I think they averaged like four yards a carry. Um, you know, with that Lions offensive line, that's pretty good. Um, the Colts actually averaged more yards per play. I think it was 5.6. The Lions had 5.5. That's a pretty good day at the office uh, for a team against the Lions. And so – these guys are going to be – they're going to be a pain in the butt. Um, and conversely, I talked about Joe Milton. Um, as far as if the Patriots do a good job on defense against the Colts, it'll be because of Joe Milton. If the Patriots win this game, um, to me, it's going to be Drake May's coming out party. Uh, he carves up this Gus Bradley defense that he hits the underneath stuff. He hits the deep end cuts sort of in front of the safeties. Um this will be really the only chance I see the Patriots winning this game is if Drake May goes off and he just comes into his own, everything works. I just don't know whether they're going to be able to block these guys up front. Um, they're really good between, you know, you got the defensive tackles, Grover Stewart and DeForest Buckner are just two of the best in the league. They are loads. Buckner is going to be a, hand, a handful for whoever plays at either guard. He mostly lines up uh, over right guard, I want to say. That that could be – I could be wrong on that. Um, Quiddy Pay and Liatu Latu, the first-round pick – those guys sort of switch off. They get after it. Um, Deo Odobingo, Odobayo, um, he comes in. He's sort of a sub interior. So their sub rushes, Latu, Quiddy Pay, um, Odobayo, and 
might be Taekwon Lewis, but they have a pretty good sub rush and they're going to be a pain in the bo- a pain in the butt for the Patriots to block on Sunday. Um, you know, I think, and the Colts cover well in the back end. I mean, I either think this is going to be a really rough game or a, just a great coming out party for Drake May against this defense. I think it's going to be a lot tougher than I thought going in, knowing what I know about Gus Bradley over the years. But I hope the Patriots have a good plan. I hope they can block it up because it is going to be a handful. So that's a look at the Colts. Let's get in the mailbag real quick. So let's start the mailbag again for those of you that are new around here um, at Boston Sports Journal. One of the things that I think um, is great about it and I hear from the members, they love it. Uh, every one of the four major sports, the writers, whether it's me, Corrales, Giardi does one as well on the Patriots sort of on on Mondays. I do more on Fridays. Uh, Corrales, Haggerty, Geth and Coolbaugh does a good job on the Red Sox. Um, there's always a weekly Q&A with each of our writers, so including me. So any questions you have about the team, the site, whatever, you know, my favorite Thanksgiving Day sides, um, you can ask that in our weekly member Q&A. And this is where I have one on Friday that I'm going to do right after I'm done with this pod. So these are some of the questions straight out of there. Paul from Holden. Hi, Greg. Just curious if you think Jonathan Kraft would be any more likely to fire Mayo after one season compared to Robert. If the right decision for the team is to fire Mayo and Robert doesn't have the stomach for it, then Robert should just empower Jonathan to do the right thing. Um, I don't know. I, I sim- simply, I don't know whether Jonathan would be more likely to fire Mayo. I just know, despite, you know, me writing, it's time for Jonathan to take a bigger role um, after sort of what we heard from Robert at the league meetings last year when I don't think his performance was very good. Um, I don't think that's really going on. I still think, you know, it's it's his ship. He's steering it. Jonathan's right there with him. But in terms of hiring and firing coaches, I think this is a, you know, Robert decision. And we know that he has an affinity for Gerard Mayo. He put him in this position. Um, not very wisely, I might add, in terms of the succession plan and all that. It wasn't well thought out. It was it was a rush to judgment something that didn't need to be done and was done and sort of pigeonholed the franchise. I think this team would have been much better off if the, if the crafts just had talked to me about succeeding Belichick. But when they, when it came down to it, they said, you know, um, you know, Gerard, we love you and we would love to, for you to be a head coach one day here, but this is too big of a job for you right now. This is a total rebuild we need somebody who's been through this before, knows what they're doing, and we're going with a guy like Mike Vrabel. Of course, we know they did not do that. Uh, BCDRES. <clears throat> this is going to be a uh, long and complicated question. I get that most teams are out coaching Mayo and his staff this season. He inherited a weak roster, was likely elevated too soon, but doesn't have and doesn't have the Rolodex to recruit a top tier coaching staff. But does that mean he could never be a talented head coach? In other words, does he have the individual traits to succeed in the NFL eventually? Or do you think a young and somewhat inexperienced version of insert name of established and talented head coach here with the same roster and coaching staff would have outperformed Mayo? Um, and then there's another part, but let me answer that. Um, look, I and well, let me read the next part because it goes into it. As a journalist, what steps can you can you take to evaluate a head coach's apt, aptitude separate from his supporting infrastructure and experience? I mean, I I don't have any I don't have like a scientific answer about this BC. I just know what I see, and this is why. This is why I think it's important to evaluate things on a micro basis, which means a game by game basis, like see 
there, there are certain benchmarks that you should get with any coach, in my opinion. And basically, especially a first year head coach, it's show me you're getting better at the end of the season. Show me you're coaching better. Show me you're developing some of the players. Show me that the team is pointed in the right direction. I don't think that is too much to ask, and I don't think that's hard to judge. I don't need to really separate to do that. Um, you know, for example, let's look at Dan Campbell, who first of all, first of all had a lot more experience than Gerard Mayo. Um, he had the interim uh, position with the Dolphins. Then he went to the Saints. He was under Parcells. He was under Sean Payton. I think he was assistant head coach uh, with the Saints. And look, we know he inherited a bad roster. They started 0-10-1. And I know a lot of people, maybe even me, thought like, all right, this is a joke. But I went and did some research. The people in Detroit after that first season uh, did not talk about firing Dan Campbell. And probably you want to know why? Is because he won three of his final six games, including they beat the Packers, who were, I think, 14-3 and three that year. They did not take that game off. I think Rodgers played the entire game. Uh, they beat the Packers in the last game of the season. Um, you know, do, do we think that the, the Patriots have really been on that tra trajectory this, this year? I mean, look, there's five games left. And this is why I don't, I don't make definitive judgments, whether it's the head coach, the roster, the rookies, the GM, all that stuff until the season's complete. It's a 17 game season. They should get that opportunity, all of them, to prove how they are at doing their jobs. And so, to me, these final five games are vitally important. I mean, I, there, there are some really bad signs to me. Um, and I've written about it at BSJ, about you know how they've come out the first game against the real divisional opponents and not Snoop Huntley. Tua, Rodgers, they come out and they get sh shellacked. Both times, these are teams that you should have prepared for in the offseason, and instead you look clueless. Um, as far as Mayo, you know, do I ha do I think he has some traits to be a successful head coach? Yes, a lot of them though are sort of cult of personality stuff. I do think I think he's a leader. I think that he relates to the younger players. I think that the players respect him right now again it's the first season there's not too many places i mean even if you think josh mcdaniels was a disaster in las vegas um there was no talk about him there was no dissension in the locker room about josh mcdaniels after year one and it didn't go that well everybody gets year one with anybody it's when you get into year two and things don't look a lot better then things can really go sideways and you start to lose the locker room. So I would say the chances of him losing the locker room or not having the respect of the players was about 2% going into this year. Next year it goes up to like 60%, it, it, you know, if they don't win games. Now I I again, I think that Mayo is a is a good leader. I think he knows how to speak. I think that you know, his corporate jargon right now plays okay in the room, but that's not being a leader is not what, an, especially what an NFL head coach is all about. I mean, that's good. I mean, as far as leadership and you know, how much players loved them and stuff like that, how high was Bill Belichick? How high was Bill Parcells um, in those regards? You, the bottom line is you got to have substance behind the words, the leadership all that stuff. You have to solve problems on your team and you have to create problems for the other team. And that's not, that does, just doesn't go down to the coordinators. Like, you know, you can be a CEO head coach all you want, but it's still, it starts with you. Just like Dan Campbell is a CEO head coach in Detroit. I mean, he stepped in, um, fired, basically took over play calling when they were 0 10 and 1, helped turn that around, helped empower Ben Johnson to be who he is now. Mayo could be doing that on the defensive side of the ball with DeMarcus Covington. Um, to this point, as far as we know, he hasn't. So, you know, he he has traits, but the traits are limited, and they got to be more football-centric for him to be successful. And right now, I think that's very much unproven. Um, uh, S. Rankator. Uh, thanks, me and Mike. 
Um, earlier in the season, you alluded to doubts or concerns within the organization about Mayo dating back to the summer. Would you care to elaborate were those concerns emanating from the ownership level based on his interactions with the team, coaching staff, media, upper management, his readiness and grasp uh, and command of his responsibilities and expectations? All of the above. Uh, I am not going to elaborate. Um, I give you the information. I do not. Uh, I give as much information that I am comfortable giving in terms of mostly protecting my sources. And um, uh, I'm not going to get into that position. It's not something that's why I've had a long career where people trust me because I I stop short. Sometimes, you know, you might want more information. You know, I'm just I'm just not going to go there because it's not worth it. You're getting the information. I'm telling you that. And I and I said uh, and I think I didn't say I said I said uh, not just members within the organization. I said um, at upper levels of the organization. So I think it's safe to say that um, all of the above would be the answer. And I still think there are concerns and that they have been calling around um, for weeks or at least weeks ago. Um, trying out not only how to support and what to do with a young quarterback, but also how to support Mayo, which is their first choice to do after the season. I think they're going to l- run into a lot of problems with that. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, some of which Felger finally stumbled upon um, this week. I mean, I told you, I said between Mayo could only have one year, if that. Um, who's coming in? For that, without a guarantee of other things or, you know, it's going to have to be a lot of guaranteed contract. So that's one thing. Again, um, if these coaches who they want to bring in call around to bill people, if not bill himself, I think that's going to be a rough sell. I think that's not going to look good on Gerard. That's just the way that it is. I mean, to be a player and a coach under Bill Belichick and he hasn't talked to you in months going back to his final season. Your final seasons together, I mean, that should tell you a lot. Um, and also, um, based on how the Patriots went about creating this staff last year, the interviews, how that process went down, the questions, I can tell you there's a lot of coaching agents that are not super impressed with what's going on here. So I think it, it's easy to talk about fantasy football, about, oh, we can add this guy and this guy. and you know, what about Brian Dayball, who I hear if he gets fired, he's more likely to take a year off than anything else. Again, he's another Bill guy. Um, you know, Josh McDaniels, I don't th- I think the chances are it's highly unlikely he would come back here. I don't completely rule it out. But if I were him, I'm not coming back to work in this situation unless Robert Kraft gives me assurances, writes it into my contract that I would succeed Gerard Mayo if he is in over his head again for a second season. Do I think that's going to happen? No. Um, AC Askin said, what do you expect the offense to evolve into over the last few weeks? First, the Rams, it was quick passes, getting the ball into Pop's hands, good doses of run games. I know it's harder when you can't run the ball, but is there any... But is there an identity that you feel will form versus Indy, Arizona going forward? Maybe a focus during the bye? Uh, (laughs) The easy answer is I have no freaking clue what they're going to look like over the last five games. I mean, they can't even figure out who's going to play on the offensive line. I fully expect another lineup this week, like I talked about earlier in the pod. So how, how is anybody supposed to know? what that offense is going to look like. I mean, I can tell you what I would like to see. Uh, I think I would like to see them start incorporating some Drake Mayo runs. Uh, um, Drake Mayo. Drake May runs, um, RPOs, things like that, especially down in the red zone, start to see what that looks like. You know, again, I, I don't even know how they're going to be able to block things, if they can block. Um, AC also asked about Ramondre. Will he continue to carry the load? Um, I just think like, look, I would, um, I would play Antonio Gibson more. I I mean, I just think he's more comfortable in the scheme they can do. He's much more comfortable in the wide zone when they do, do, do that. They sort of, you know, mix it up these days. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's the, where they are, how they're doing things, 
you know, it seems like they're, you know, game planning week to week, what they're going to do. Um, I think sometimes there's missteps. Like I think against Miami, there were a bunch of missteps. I thought they did a good job against the Rams. That should be their approach basically every week. Um, but yeah, there's, there's really not much, um, that I could say on that. I just, I, I just want to know how they're going to block things and who's going to be out there. And then maybe we can go from there. Um, again, if you like the mailbag, if you like to get questions in, you got to be a BSJ member. It's only 50 bucks for the year. Um, you not you get on not only access to that, but also my film. I've been putting like full halves basically as I grade the film, um, whether it's offense or defense, depending on the week, I've been posting video of full house. You're talking like 45 minutes um, worth of film from the game. So it's worth it even just from that perspective. So uh, come on over and join us. Uh, we would love to have you. Uh, game pick. So far this season, one last week. So that's good. Uh, I am now 4-6-2 and two against the spread, 7-5 and five straight up. The line is the Colts, minus 2.5. 44 and a half over under um, sort of repeating what I said earlier. If the Patriots defense do, does well in this game, it's because of Joe Milton. If the Patriots offense does well in this game, it's because of Drake may having his coming out party, having his way with Gus Bradley's defense. Um, so I think you really, the storyline, if the biggest storyline is going to be, if the Patriots win this game, it's going to be Drake May, here we go, put it all together. They eliminated the stupid penalties, which there should be less of those at home. Uh, but here we go, Drake May, all aboard the bandwagon. Not that that's not already full right now. If they lose, I could see the storyline being, man, that is some really cool stuff that Shane Steichen does with Anthony Richardson, with his legs, with the pass game, very similar to what he did with Jalen Hurts. And then you're looking at Alex Van Pelt just running the old West Coast system with Drake May, and it could be a stark contrast where people are really calling for the Patriots to move in a different direction and offensive coordinator after the season. So I think this is a big game, and it's probably their last winnable game uh, on the schedule. And so, you know, they're staring at it. If they don't win this game, they're staring at 3-14, and 14, which uh, is not good enough and not acceptable. And I think depending on how those last four games go, two against the Bills, one against the Chargers, one against the Cardinals, if they get boat raced in those games, um, not quite sure. I think Gerard Mayo is fully guaranteed about coming back next year. So um, big stretch coming up here. I will be in the stadium with Mike. Can't wait for it. Uh, you know, to be back here. For the aftermath on Sunday, uh, normally Tuesday and Thursday, and uh, we will talk to you later. Thanks so much. Make sure you check out Prize Picks and Game Time, and help support our sponsors.